Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the panel session, Indigenous Shakespeare and Cultural Translation. I shall list all four speakers now so that the papers can follow each other without interruption. And as you know, questions will follow afterwards. Scott Manning Stevens is Associate Professor of English and Native American Studies and is Director of Native American and Indigenous Studies at Syracuse University. His paper today is entitled, Centers of Power, Indigeneity, Shakespeare, and Colonialism. Lewa Yim is an independent scholar living in San Francisco, and her paper today is entitled, Power in Hawaiian, Maori Appropriations of Shakespeare. Terence Riley is professor of English at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. His paper is entitled, Bottom Thou Art Translated, the place of official languages in Alaskan productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream. James Luhan is department chair of cinematic arts and technology at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. His paper today is entitled, The Challenge of Adapting Shakespeare to American Indian Cultures and History. Professor Stevens. Sego Skanagoa Golonyak Dache Scott Stevens Yankyats. I thought it would be appropriate to start with some Mohawk in the morning. I don't know um, I don't know how often it's been spoken at Shakespeare Association. So um, I promised my mother wherever I go, some words of that will go out. So that word, that greeting, Sego Skanagoa, means is it still the great peace with you? And we shorten it often to simply say go, which is like saying still, and hopefully they'll say still. So I hope it is the great peace with you. I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging <coughs> that we are on indigenous land. We are on the Gabrielino Tongva people's land, and I am delighted as a Mohawk person to be here. I also want to, of course, thank the organizing committee and the tech people that have helped out this morning. It's a surprise. You know, when, when I came down at 8 o'clock and I saw the, this big empty room, I thought, oh, dear, what have I gotten myself into? But um, I, I'm hoping that you'll share with the panelists and myself the notion that this is long overdue, right? That, um, Indigenous peoples of the Americas, especially North America, have been encountering Shakespeare for centuries. And yet there's, there's relatively little scholarship on it. That's the thing we all hope to correct. Um, but it's a, it's a field that's ready to be explored. There are new aspects of it, but there are some early modern aspects of it. Can I, sorry, I forgot the clicker. So when I'm thinking of centers of power, of course I'm thinking of the metropoles that produce um, colonial power, in particular settler colonial um, power. And if you don't know that term, let me just briefly um, explain it a bit. So we talk about colonialism in a, in a general way, but since the 1990s, especially in indigenous studies, it has become important to distinguish between extractive colonialism what we had a lot of in Africa, Asia, and so on, where a colonial power went, sought raw materials, labor, and whatever, and was eventually either forced out or left on its own devices. And that would be most of Africa, a lot of Asia, right? Settler colonialism is where the colonial powers that be want the land, and they want it permanently. And that means, as according to the late Patrick Wolf, the logic of settler colonialism is extermination, right? So in a settler colonial dynamic, the indigenous population goes from being 100% of the population of the space to usually under 10% of the population of the space. And there's no post-colonialism in our future. 
the efforts that we have then creatively for ourselves are to decolonize our own minds and culture. But the post part is the thing we won't have. Right? So in settler colonial cultures, the power dynamic between what is represented by Shakespeare as an authority, as a cultural um, high watermark, is different than, say, in a post-colonial structure in Africa or India, translating and reinterpreting Shakespeare's plays in a liberated position as to recognizing that they have long been, in a settler colonial society, the marker of your educational oppression, right? I did a little straw poll among my native students, which happily I have some 200 of in, in Syracuse, and said, just take a moment and write down what you think of when you think of Shakespeare, if you think of Shakespeare. And the comments were not surprising. Um, they thought of it as something, as one of them said, I think rich white people like him. Um, one of them said thoughtfully, I think people interested in Shakespeare are probably not the same people interested in indigenous studies. And I said, well, that wouldn't be me. Uh, <laughs> but um, one also said, and I thought one of my favorite comments was, I've seen some of his plays. He's a great storyteller. And we, our cultures value stories. And so if we have a commonality, let's hope it's there. But in terms of this relationship, I wanted to start, um, as those of you who know me would not be surprised, with a Mohawk example. <laughs> um, and it's 1710. This diplomatic group called the Four Kings, you know, everyone's a chief, and if you're not a chief, then even better to be a king. Um, there are four representatives from the Mohawk community. Three of them are actually Mohawk. One is Mahican, um, another non-Iroquois people, who were there as part of a kind of diplomatic spectacle to shore up the relationships between the Haudenosaunee, or the Iroquois, and the British as allies. We are an independent nation, Iroquois, until after American independence, right? We're not part of the British Empire. We're not part of colonial Britain. We are an ally of the British during the revolution, but we are not a part of that. Uh, we're not a subject nation. So the, in this theatrical spectacle of diplomacy and indigenous subjects as they're interpreted, they're brought to Hampton Court. Their paintings, these are full length paintings that are now in the Archive of Canada become a show's piece and they, they're kind of taken around town, shown off. And when I was reading about them years ago, I was surprised to see that one of the things that was done for them is they were taken to see a performance of Macbeth. So if they understood it, it's unclear what they might have thought of British notions of hospitality or kingship. <laughs> um, <laughs> one might be nervous, but... Um, there's a famous moment where the, the theater's packed because they know that the kings are going to be there, and they start chanting, the kings, the kings, the kings, and they interrupt the play until the director brings the four kings on stage, seats them so they can watch the remainder of the play and be watched as they watch the remainder of the play. And so in a way, we're kind of staging something similar. How do, how do, we, look at, how do we look at Shakespeare? But um, I think of it as a moment of what I call unexpected encounters, right? Their visit was noted by literary figures like Addison and Steele, Daniel Defoe, and others note this famous visit. There's even something the year later called the Mohawk Scare of London where a group of aristocratic louts basically calling themselves Mohawks and wearing turbans um, <laughs> were going around you know, vandalizing things and saying the Mohawks have done this. So we have this presence, but we shouldn't be surprised. It's not the first time, of course, indigenous people have been in a British court. I think of Pocahontas' celebrated visit in 1616 and the fact that she saw Johnsonian mask, right? Um, she's president of the Vision of Delight, 
Who would have thought, right? This Algonquin princess at the vision of delight. It's tempting to wish she would have met someone uh, like Shakespeare near the end of his life, at the end of his life, and maybe even seen an early version of The Tempest. But this habit, right, so this is Iroquois. You recognize probably the outline of the current state of New York, or as they say, vulgarly called New York. Um, that's our homeland. These are typical of the printed broadsides that were going around at the time of their visit because it was considerably popular. There's a puppet show <laughs> arranged to reenact their visit. This is a, a guide from it in 1711. Pocahontas and Johnson. And so I think of these, these kind of possible collisions that we know of, of course, the Tempest and the debates over how colonial is it or not, right? Scholars have long noted the minor influence of Strachey's account of the shipwreck in Bermuda or the opening scene, for the opening scenes, or pointed out Florio's translation passages from the essay of on cannibals finds its way into the speech of Gonzalo in The Tempest, but the geography of the play does seem decidedly Mediterranean. Still, how can we represent Caliban without thinking of the colonized speaker, right? This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. Whence thou camest first, when thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me, wouldst give me water with berries in it and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less. That beautiful speech, that Caliban music, is something that any colonized person must react to and, of course, have, right? There's a whole legacy in the Caribbean of recognizing oneself and one's subject position in those words, those beautiful words by Caliban. Right? Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that, if I then had waked after long sleep, will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming, the clouds methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me. When I waked, I cried to dream again. Speaking of stealing islands from people, um, we might not expect to encounter Shakespeare so far away as Hawaii but we'll hear about that today. Um, beginning in the 1850s and through 1926, versions of Charles and Mary Lamb's prose, you know, versions of Shakespeare's plays were serialized in translation in Hawaiian language newspapers, right? So at the eve of the annexation of the kingdom, they, they're printing Julius Caesar, right? Um, in Hawaiian, a fascinating thing which we'll be learning more about today. The translation from Kanaka and serialized Hawaiian languages in newspapers and in performances is one of those unexpected encounters. For me, that unexpected encounter came in 2007 at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., where I was walking down the street, and I don't think you can make out on that outdoor poster, it's the Tlingit Macbeth, right? So Tlingit language is the language spoken by the Tlingit people on the northwest coast in Washington area, and Macbeth was translated and performed in that language. And I was walking with a friend, and we saw that, and I said, finally, you know, <laughs> um, we've been waiting for the Tlingit Macbeth for a long time. Um, and I did see it and it was a phenomenal experience to me, partly because it wasn't simply a translation. And I wanna talk just a bit about that in the, for the rest of my paper. This version started out as a project in Alaska and Terry will talk a bit about that later um, in, in terms of Alaskan engagement with Shakespeare. But it started out in 2003, directed by non-Native American art director, Anita Maynard Loesch working with Tlingit speakers and actors in Juno's Perseverance Theater, 
um, that version of the play had been almost wholly Shakespeare's English with minimal phrases of Tlingit substituted as translations for passages from the play. What was Tlingit about that version was that it was set within traditional Tlingit context and performed by native actors. As to why one might produce a Tlingit Macbeth beyond the novelty of it, Maynard Loesch has explained that the idea came to her during more than a decade-long residence in Huna, Alaska, a small Tlingit village along the coast with some 700 inhabitants, 90% of whom were Tlingit citizens. She had been struck by the continuation of the clan system within their society, and it brought to mind the clan system of Highland Scots, which turned her mind to consider Macbeth as a play within that context. When she began directing the theater productions in Juno, she saw an opportunity to realize her desire and stage a version of the play that would hopefully resonate strongly with the local indigenous population. Maynard Loesch gives an account of her part in conceiving of and directing the various versions of the Tlingit Macbeth in a brief essay published in Scott Newstock and Ayanna Thompson's 2010 collection, Wayward Macbeth. And I was a little shocked when I started this project that that's really the only essay written on that to date. And, um, and it's more of an interview than an essay. So I guess it's to me and others to take up the slack. Um, but in her essay, she outlines a number of concerns she had when developing these productions in 2003 and 2007 with the final version to be performed in DC. The final version was the most ambitious of the various iterations of Maynard Loesch's production because the play was performed at the National Museum of the American Indian and was largely now translated into the Tlingit language. The challenges, of course, of translating Shakespeare's language into an Amerindian one are vast and should be the subject of another essay. But in the first version of Maynard Loesch's Tlingit Macbeth, the challenge was how to embed the plot within a Tlingit cultural idiom that was both accurate and respectful in its representation of Tlingit people, their customs and values. As with any reconception of Shakespeare's original setting, be it medieval Japan or Mum the Mumbai underworld or amongst gangs in contemporary Melbourne, the challenge is to make the audience believe that the change of venue is more than a desire to innovate for innovation's sake. Maynard Loesch's may well have been may well have seen connections between the moors of traditional Tlingit society and Shakespeare's Scotland. Macbeth and his wife's primal transgression, right, that of hosts conspiring against guests and against their community's leader, is a crime that would easily resonate across cultural and linguistic barriers. By setting the play in pre-contact Clinket um, past, Maynard Loesch seems to have been striving for those universals presumed to underpin Shakespeare's work in a manner not dissimilar to Bohannon's famous young anthropologist among the Tiv in the bush. But in Maynard Loesch's conception, there was never simply a matter of setting, stage design, and costuming. It was rather a true community production, right, due to her extremely conscientious engagement with members of the Tlingit population in southern Alaska. Right? The, Reading her description of how she went about seeking the support of elders from the community brings to mind what we would call in museum studies best practice protocols of contemporary curators and cultural centers. Such community-based curating has developed over the last decades of the 20th century as a means of acknowledging past abuses by museums relating to their display of Native American artifacts and depictions of Native American societies in general. Before such community-based curating became widespread, and it is by no means universal today, museum curators trusting in their own expertise and formal educations saw themselves as adjudicating experts when it came to cultures they had deemed primitive. Native expertise was often ignored or never acknowledged, and cultural taboos and sensitivities routinely ignored. Maynard Loesch was keen not to replicate the mistakes of the past, and when she first went to respected elders of the Tlingit community to explain her purpose in the proposed production, which she says was intended to be a celebration rather than an exploitation of Tlingit culture, they were warm to the idea. 
This was largely accomplished by taking community concerns into all aspects of the production. Many not only worked with the native cast, many of whom were Tlingit speakers, but also brought Tlingit artists as set designers and costume designers. The visual arts of the Northwest Coast nations are among the most readily, um, readily recognizable of North American indigenous artistic traditions, and it would have been easy to create a pastiche of this aesthetic without concern for the symbolic meaning behind such designs. But in this production, Tlingit artist Robert Davis Hoffman chose motifs that conveyed meaning without violating cultural sensitivities. Hoffman said in an interview with a local newspaper that the set and costume designers were, quote, careful not to use anything that might be construed as proprietary because the clans and families own designs, right? Um, and so nothing proprietary would be used. In his case, this meant when creating traditional style crests that would represent a clan's, uh, a character's clan, he did not use actual clan totems from the community. Instead, he used non-clan Tlingit symbols that would resonate with the Tlingit community with an essence of a character, with the essence of the character, while being legible to the traditional community. For instance, in choosing the crest for Macbeth, he chose a stylized crab, which is not a traditional clan animal, but is associated in Tlingit symbolism with stealing or appropriating wrongly, right? So the, the crab is a known usurper, as a way. This struck Hoffman as appropriate of a character who would violently usurp the crown, and likewise, Duncan's crest was that of a deer, an animal associated with peace in the Tlingit tradition. Similar scruples governed costume. D designer Nikki Morris, also a Tlingit um, citizen, and her choice of traditional clothing. clothing. She chose from materials and decorations that had been in use before contact with Europeans and avoided proprietary designs. Added to the visual cues that clearly spoke most to the Tlingit community, members were specifically choreographed in dances by Jean Tagaban that brought together forms of traditional Tlingit dance and drumming with narrative elements of the plot. George Hawley composed original Tlingit songs in order to avoid cultural restrictions placed on traditional music that should not be played outside of ceremonial spaces. And <clears throat> likewise, attended to the, the mores and, and taboos of the culture. Such a collaborative effort takes this production into a very different territory, to a point where Macbeth is reimagined by members of a community entirely alien to its author, and thus indigenized in the process. The final aspect of this engagement came in the development in the Washington production of the play. The director and actors decided that they wished to do more with the Tlingit language itself, and in the third version, the majority of the play is in the Tlingit language, with the exception of the speeches by Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, which remain in Shakespeare's English. The thinking was, according to Maynard Loesch, in this production, the conceit of Macbeth's alienation from his own people and their values is highlighted by having the character speak Tlingit only when pretending to conform to their, ver to their values, but when speaking between Lady Macbeth or in soliloquy, he speaks English. If intended to serious, <coughs> um, if intended um, to resonate with non-native viewers, part of the linguistic choice was prog <coughs> problematic to say the least. We had to read, of course, super titles, projected on the stage, but then were given those great speeches in English which we could anticipate and enjoy. To cynics among us, it might seem that it was just a way of preserving some of the best loved speeches of the play while keeping the English speaking audience engaged. In a way, it could have been that, but it is a strategy that I found effective when watching it. Putting aside the bilingual hybridity of the production, we should consider the enormity of the task of translating Shakespeare's English into any Amerindian language. Translation is never simply a matter of substituting one word for its foreign equivalent, but shared linguistic structures, social norms make it easier within a European context. For good reason, Germans speak very proudly of Unser Shakespeare, but the shift to Tlingit was never going to be that easy and represents a staggering challenge. 
Whence comes this desire to sh translate Shakespeare into indigenous languages? We could ask if the act of translation is any more than qu a question of translating something into Greek or German. It is perhaps because Shakespeare has become so deeply associated with the hegemony of British culture in those settler colonial spaces that it was expected one would appreciate Shakespeare as a sign of one's civilization and civilizing process. The major settler colonial nations, US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, have continued to use Shakespeare as a high watermark within their own cultures, and you can see why there might be resistance from within indigenous cultures. And yet, as one of my students said, Shakespeare is a great storyteller, and we value stories. When I consider, consider Shakespeare's stories and their poetry, if poetry itself is untranslatable as poetry, the themes treated by these dramas and events are not. Rather than use this occasion for us as indigenous communities, uh, rather they are, use, are occasions for us as indigenous communities to enjoy our own storytelling traditions reimagined through Shakespeare in our own language and in our own idioms. Indigenizing Shakespeare may be one way of giving a voice to our creative traditions by confronting a legacy thrust upon us. Reworking these stories to fit our situations is likewise a powerful means of indigenizing this work as we have engaged with it. Consider two native written productions, both premiered in Los Angeles at the Autry Museum, which supports Native American playwriting. One by one of our speakers today, which we'll hear more about, James Luhan's Kino and Teresa, which is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet set during the Pueblo Revolt in 1680 or the other by Choctaw writer Randy Reinholtz, Off the Rails, a retelling of Measure for Measure, not at a, at a convent, now at an Indian boarding school in the American West. The very fact that the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, where Professor Lewin teaches, held a two-day celebration of Shakespeare in 2016, this is the poster for it, called Shakespeare Our Way, uh, <laughs> tells you that there is an indigenous engagement already out there that we need to attend to. Um, it demonstrates that Native students are involved in thinking about this complicated colonial legacy and what it means to them. These productions bring indigenous Shakespeare into the 21st century, and I hope some of you will consider studying and teaching those works as we go forward, and we learn more about all of them from our, our speakers today. Nyawe Goa, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Aloha kako. Aloha. My name is Lehua Yem and I come from Kaneohe in the district of Ko'olaupoko on the island of Oahu. I want to first thank the Tongva ancestors and present day people who persevere and fight to maintain a Tongva world in the midst of intensive overdevelopment and settler wealth generation on their traditional lands. Next, I want to lovingly acknowledge members of the SAA who have loved and sustained our organization, putting in countless hours of their labor and thought, culminating in making this panel possible. From a founding ancestor, Leeds Barrel, who is with us today, to past steadfast stewards of the SAA, and the current members and trustees who have worked so hard to open our doors and minds beyond what had seemed possible even five years ago. Remember last year's Color of Membership panel? So, mahalo nui, thanks for the opportunity that brings us to this moment. My talk today on Hawaiian and Maori appropriations of Shakespeare will move through three main topical arcs that spring from appropriations of three separate Shakespeare plays, two in a 19th century Hawaiian language newspaper and one in a 21st century Maori performance. The distances of time and place that these arcs travel hopefully will add to our ongoing conversations about Shakespeare, periodization, and politics, including race and domination in a manner that decenters us by working from the putative margins of our Shakespearean world. I want to start with my own appropriation of Shakespeare 
invoking a character whose representation speaks pointedly to recent political experiences of my own people. She speaks, but she is not understood. She speaks her own language in her own homeland, and she is mocked. She is translated for, translated into, yet as the daughter of perhaps the last native king, she is unable to speak in any way that is not either a joke or mere noise. She is the Welsh Ali Iwahine, Glendower's daughter, who in Act Three of Henry IV, Part I, can only be represented for us as mere trace in the playtext itself. The stage direction reads, the lady speaks in Welsh. Four times she speaks, the lady again in Welsh. A fifth time she sings in Welsh, a noise that Hotspur says is worse sounding than his dog howling in Irish. Colleagues have written of the Welsh chiefess and racism, but I invoke her and appropriate her now to remind us that settler colonialism and its logic of elimination must still acknowledge the trace of a persisting alternative to its newly planted social contract and polity, even if only to mock it or portray it as at most an annoying noise rather than a political voice from an abiding nation. So, part one. On January 19th, 1867, one of the many Hawaiian language newspapers in print in Hawaii at this time, Kanupepa Kuokoa, published a small note from a reader on page two of their weekly edition. It read, He mahalo ya wilama ihe, giving thanks to William Shakespeare. It continues, Maho'olelo Hawaii in Hawaiian. Quote, we have seen in the government English language newspaper a thank you for the translation from English to Hawaiian of the Mo'olelo, the stories by the man above mentioned. We want to continue to enjoy reading these great and excellent stories. This note comes to the newspaper in response to the serial publication of Hawaiian language translations of the Lamb adaptations of A Comedy of Errors and The Tempest, uh, so-called Mo'olelo from Shakespeare. Nupepa Kuoko'o ran them from December 1st, 1866 to January 12th, 1867, a week before the issue in which this letter to the editor was printed. In this small letter, we catch a quick glimpse of an under-researched and underwritten about public sphere in the mid-19th century kingdom of Hawaii, which flourishes discursively through a copious newspaper print culture. The 19th and early 20th century Hawaiian language textual archive is likely one of the largest in the Pacific and across native North America. When New England missionaries brought a printing press with them in the, in the late 1820s, their intention was to found their Christian mission in Hawaii with a capacity to learn Hawaiian, develop a written orthography, translate the Bible, and print it and literacy teaching materials in short order, which is a small agenda. But it was the regent, Queen Ka'ahumanu, and later the young King Kamehameha III, who made sure that the Hawaiian people, chiefs and commoners alike, were commanded to quickly learn reading and writing, so as to build He Aupuni Palapala, a nation of literacy. Nupepa Kuokoa made sure to provide the Hawaiian language reading population, which included not only the native Kanaka, but also those immigrants and visitors from Europe, America, and Asia who could speak Hawaiian, with rich coverage of global news stories, local political developments, including laws passed and legislative proceedings, as well as advertisements for the latest commodities to come off the ships at harbor. But Kuokoa led the way in bringing together the old and the new, or the old in the new, by employing the young Hawaiian historian Samuel Kamakau and other mission-trained Hawaiian intellectuals to publish older chants, songs, stories, histories, and legendary tales alongside new translations of Europe, European and American literary texts. Soon, readers themselves were sending in letters to the paper, debating regional or historical variations in the published Hawaiian songs or stories. And the Hawaiian language newspapers also gave space to publish original reader compositions in traditional oral forms, most notably and beautifully grief chants or kaniko. The emergence of a fundamentally oral performative genre as a printed genre was profound. In the deaths that gave birth to the Kanikao compositions and publication, we can read a plethora of articulations of a love of the land, winds, waters, and rains that gave literal place to Hawaiian relationships in a metaphorical language that registered the intimacy of a people with their aina, their land. 
Into this world of words comes a Kanaka named George W. Kanuha, who sometimes wrote or translated under the pen name Oniula. It was his job at New Paper Kuokoa to enliven the paper's pages with contributions in general literature. But besides his translations from English to Hawaiian, we know of him through his memorialization. Kanuha was born in 1845 in North Kona on Hawaii Island and studied on Maui at the mission's Lahaina Luna College. It was there that Kanuha really developed his skills in English, there that he was forevermore in search of knowledge. His obituary notes, whenever he sat up, he had a book in front of his face. If he was lying down, face down, or up, or sideways, before his eyes was wisdom like his eyelids. Will one lack knowledge if one seeks it out? No, no. Mr. Kanuha was a kupa Hawaii, a native Hawaiian citizen by skin and by birth. But his mouth was the mouth of a British man when he spoke English. And he could translate from English into Hawaiian freely. Hawaii owes him a debt for his aloha in his assistance in the Hawaiian language newspapers. This is the man who brought our letter writing reader and her compatriots so much pleasure in the translation of Shakespeare's Mo'olelo. In Kanuha's translation of The Winter's Tale, we find an expanded kind of liberty that he built on in his previous translations of The Comedy of Errors and The Tempest. His Winter's Tale began its publication on the same front page as Samuel Kamakau's continuing history of King Kamehameha I's rise to power and rule. Whereas the historian titled his column, Kamo'olelo Kamehameha Kahi, Kanuha titles his tale, Kamo'i Leonetesi, King Leontes. Its secondary title is The Winter's Tale. Thus, Kanuha's translation of Shakespeare's story of a king who rules poorly because of a jealous sickness he cannot or will not shake until his dynastic afterlife and loving relations are stripped from him stands as a political morality story to be compared to Kamakau's history of the Pono Ali'i, the good, the righteous first king of the Hawaiian Islands. As an example of Kanuha's confidence in his appropriation and translation of Shakespeare, we can hear Hawaiian oral forms of questioning the rectitude of a ruler's behavior in sentences that Kanuha seems to have added to the text, exceeding the original. And when it comes to the famous unrolling and reading of the Delphic Oracle Parchment, another example of an oral genre transformed by Shakespeare into a written form, Kanuha gives his readers an amazing Hawaiianization of the text that is both old and new. To remind us, the Lamb's prose text says, Hermione is innocent, Polixenes blameless, Camillo a true subject, Leontes a jealous tyrant, and the king shall live without an heir if that which is lost be not found. Now there's no keeping a Hawaiian from working with a good political prophecy. And Kanuha patterns his prose into a Hawaiian textual poetic form of listing called the helu, a structure that underpins genres like wanana, prophecy, and pule, prayer, a listing structure that is the backbone of knowledge preservation in memorized and orally transmitted Hawaiian sciences. So, Kanuha translates thus. He hava ole o heremione. He hala ole o polikinesi. He ho ike oya ii o kamio. He lilo ino ko leonetesi. Here, the helu or list repetition can be heard explicitly. He hava ole, he hala ole. And the Hawaiianized names turn into an end rhyme, polykinesi and leonitesi. Second, Kanuha's word choices invoke a much older legal language of kapu, or oral law, and transgression, or the lack thereof, to say that Hermione is hevaole, without spiritual and legal wrong, and that Polixenes is halaole, has not himself transgressed. Kanuha then gives Camilo a much newer Hawaiian description, that of ho'ike oya'i'o, a term that arises in the legal world of contracts and judicial testimony that does, not, that does not really get going in Hawaii until the 1840s and 50s. It means something like, Camillo is a true sworn man. And then Leontes' tyranny is described even more complexly. Helilo ino ko leonetesi. And for his part, Leontes has been taken by an ino, a bad immoral feeling, a wickedness. Kanuha's translation is a Hawaiian appropriation of a Shakespearean political story 
that makes the old in the new is something not fully British nor fully Hawaiian, not wholly ancient nor completely modern. And Kanuha's service to Hawaii, done out of his own incredible aptitude and aloha for the world of words circulating in a Hawaiian kingdom of literacy, bespeaks a flourishing native polity, completely comfortable with itself, not as a margin to the rest of the world, but as a center in its own right. Part two. On December 14, 1893, a cartoon drawn by American political caricaturist J. Franklin Van Sant appeared on the front pages of the New York World Daily Newspaper. The cartoon, entitled The Hawaiian Situation Explained, depicted U.S. President Grover Cleveland and Queen Lili Okalani in a Hawaiian throne room. As Lili stands two steps below the throne's dais, Cleveland stands next to the throne, hat raised, as he gallantly offers the queen her throne back but the throne is compromised, its seat and back a nest of sharp bayonets, making it impossible to sit on without harm. The crown rests precariously on top of the throne as if resting on the chair's head. It's a throne of knives absent the body of a monarch who is only imaginable as penetrated by death. And yet there she is, Queen Lil, a jet black queen dressed in a white formal gown, her gloved right index finger poised between exaggerated, overly full lips in a moment of consideration, of hesitation about resuming governance of her kingdom. The sarcasm of the cartoon's caption that Queen Lil is really not eager to return to the throne is underscored by the threatening bayonets and the black queen's paws. She cannot have what she has fought for the entire year since a junta of Haole men Hawaiian citizens and foreigners overthrew her government on January 17, 1893. She cannot have her thrown back without risking repeated stabbing, as those knives keep Hawaiian self-governance in abeyance, threatening it and her with elimination. Some six years before the 1893 overthrow, Queen Lili Okalani's brother, King Kalako, was physically forced to sign and promulgate a constitution drawn up by the same men who would labor, later overthrow his sister. This so-called bayonet constitution of 1887 included the curtailing of monarchical powers, the placement of governing powers in the hands of the legislature and the king's cabinet, the extension of voting rights to foreigners, i.e. non-citizens of the kingdom, and the restriction of the franchise to men who owned Hawaiian land. When Lili Kalani ascended the throne in 1890, she inherited her brother's troubles with these hale, as well as a constitution that restricted her powers and prevented most native Kanaka from voting for their own legislative representatives. Her first desire was to promulgate a new constitution, one that would restore monarchical independence and suffrage for native and naturalized Hawaiian citizens. But before she could promulgate this new constitution, the authors of the current bayonet constitution took steps to form their committee of safety and to make sure that they would isolate and confine the queen, separating her from her most ardent and high-ranking supporters. In addition, the junta enlisted the questionable aid of the captain of the warship, the USS Boston, which had been docked in Honolulu Harbor as part of a US investigation of rumored troubles and the risk to American lives and property in the kingdom. When the junta took control of the government in their own name, not in the name of the United States. They made themselves rulers of a new republic, even as the American warship threatened to put down any efforts at restoring the queen with cannon fire from the ship. Eventually, the US president sent an emissary to investigate what had happened and what role the naval warship had played, if any, in the hostile aggressions against a kingdom that the US had numerous treaties of friendship and trade with. But as the cartoon noted, restoring the queen was more dangerous than an investigation might reveal. In early January of 1895, a royalist faction waged a three-day armed conflict against the now Republic of Hawaii. As a result, the rebellion's leaders were arrested, tried, and convicted of treason. Death was their punishment. The queen herself was arrested, tried, and convicted, sentenced to, imprison sentenced to imprisonment in a single palace room. On January 24, 1895, she abdicated her throne in exchange for the commutation of the rebels' death sentences. After long months of confinement, the queen was released on parole on eight, September 6th, 1896. The government officially pardoned the queen on October 13th, which restored to her all of her civil liberties and rights, including her freedom to travel to Washington, D.C. to plead the case of restoration directly with the U.S. president. It's the very next week that a Hawaiian language translation of Julius Caesar begins its serial publication in Nupepa Ku'okoa. The editors tell their readers that they have recently received this translation from a Hawaiian youth and they are offering it to their readers for their perusal and enjoyment. Their hope, they write, 
is that their readers will appreciate the rich thought of the story, and they desire their readers to put together the issues in which the Mo'olelo runs, bring them into the print house, and have them bound to become a treasured book of Hawaiian stories for their libraries. This translation appears well-timed to be read as a commentary on political violence, including the knife imagery of a bayonet constitution and the overthrow of a supposed tyrant to save a fair republic. The translation by a man later identified as John Keola looks to be skilled, but it's frustrating and perhaps telling that the translation only covers part of the play from its first line to the end of act two, scene one, where the translation stops abruptly after Brutus's conversation with Agarius. I can't say absolutely that the play translation never starts up again. There's a lot of issues that you have to go through on microfilm to figure this out. I'm still working on it. But well into the year of issues that follows, it does not return. Instead, the pages of Ku'oko are taken up with urgent reporting about American debates over annexing Hawaii to become a territory of the United States. This news commingles with Hawaiian language reporting on other imperial conflicts around the world, including those in Cuba, the Philippines, and Turkey. Even within this small beginning of Julius Caesar, the repeated imagining and speaking of political fears and conspiracy to affect regime change bear much closer attention as an articulation of what may be indigenous political thought and or settler logics of elimination. Arc three. In 2012, the Globe Theater in London presented an international multilingual globe to globe festival as part of the London Olympics. 37 Shakespeare plays were performed by theater troops from 37 different countries in their own languages. Aotearoa was given the opening slot, and their Te Reo Māori, their Māori language version of Troilus and Crescent, began the festival. And while the Globe perhaps intended this festival to bring the world's appropriations of Shakespeare home, the Māori troops' fight master and kapahaka coach Jameis Webster noted that the Maori were going not to talk back to the metropole, but to talk with and reconnect with the expat Maori community in England, the modern iwi named Natiranana, the London tribe. This Te Reo Maori translation of Troilus was done by Teho Mihiata Mason, a Te Reo Maori expert and language guardian. In interviews, Mason described her task as a translator of Shakespearean classical play about the Trojan War as a kind of linguistic going back into an older te reo Māori, a classical Māori. She calls it Māori Māori. It was, in her own words, kahanga nui, a really big undertaking. Mason's translation and the performance of the play are world reviving. And she made sure that this performance of rule and of war was articulated through the unique Maori forms of kapahaka and political oratory, all in a classical Maori language that even the actors who were fluent in modern Maori had to work hard to speak and understand. In talking about her translation of Nestor's speech to Agamemnon in Act 1, Scene 3, Mason describes the attractiveness of Nestor's extended metaphor of why he wants uh, an expert to do the job in times of great difficulty. She found in this moment a very Maori meditation on te reingarehe, expertise, and te reingarapa, inexpertise. In this speech, Nestor contrasts the expert skill required to steer and navigate the giant rib boats versus the relative lack of skill one could get away with when piloting much smaller boats. That is, of course, until the really big storm comes, and it sends the little boats scurrying back into the harbor lest they and their crews become food for Neptune's appetite. In translating the speech into Te Reo Māori, Mason alludes to the difficulty of her own task. There is so much truth in this text, she says. Don't pretend to do something you cannot. Leave it to the expert. What we cannot see directly in Mason's translation or in the performance is the political symbolism of a Tuhoi woman translating a Shakespeare play about endless war and its danger. The Tuhoi are a tribe that never signed the Treaty of Waitangi. They never ceded sovereignty over their homelands to the crown, despite land appropriation and crown efforts to take Uruera on its own. Locked in a state of seemingly endless war after the 2007 anti-terrorism raids that the crown made on the Tuhoi homeland, which terrorized the Tuhoi and fully embarrassed the crown, in 2008, the Tuhoi and the crown began talks to settle governance over the Tuhoi homeland. From 2008, through the signing of the landmark settlement, the Te Uere Act of 2014, tense negotiations for finding some way out of war happened. It was during those years that Mason translated Troilus and Cressida. And I can't help but wonder, 
Could she, in setting Shakespeare's play firmly in Te Ao Maori, be, have been prefiguring the most amazing Tuhor achievement in their settlement, the wresting of their homeland from the crown's world of white possession and property ownership? Epilogue. In June 2014, the United States Department of the Interior issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to solicit public comments on whether and how the Department of the Interior should facilitate the reestablishment of a government-to-government -government relationship with the Native Hawaiian community. In political shorthand, this was a new tactic in a 15-year struggle from some members of the Native Hawaiian community and non-Hawaiian politicians to federally recognize Native Hawaiians as an Indian tribe. From tw June 23rd, 23rd through July 28th, 2014, 15 public commentary hearings were held on six of the eight major Hawaiian islands in order to get feedback on these proposed rule changes. And during that time, some friends and I undertook the task of live transcribing on Facebook the testimony of those who came forward at the hearings. Hundreds of people spoke. And we needed to do this, we decided, because Hawaiians at work couldn't watch the live video stream, and somebody had to do the description and transcription before the official public transcription was released months later. In addition, we were worried about what would happen to people who spoke in native Hawaiian. We were worried that the official transcript would silence voices. And this experience with live transcribing the voices of my people was powerful, transformative. Yet, months and months later, when the official transcripts came out, there they were. Interruptions and lacunae everywhere in the testimony of my people. Parentheses, inaudible. Parentheses, unintelligible. Parentheses, speaking Hawaiian and other language. If we cannot speak self-determination and our own struggle for justice and sovereignty are in our own homeland, in our own language, if the logic of elimination that we all live under and benefit from continues to make the lady speak Welsh without even trying to record our olelo of persistence, our language that makes our world come into being, then what are we doing? Race studies will not solve this problem as race and blood quantum have been weapons used to facilitate the elimination of our abiding political existence. Instead, I ask you all to think hard about practices of aloha for land and language and each other. Maybe, just maybe, we can find a way to be at home with each other without killing each other. Thank you. Hi, my name is Terry Riley. <clears throat> I'm, I've changed the title of my uh, paper just a, a bit to eliminate the heterotopia to make the paper shorter. And I'm just going to reference it, but uh, not actually develop it. I want to thank Leeds Barrow for uh, chairing the panel and the Shakespeare Association for letting us do this. Um, it's, uh, as Scott said, it's been a long time coming. Um, in the spring of 2015, the Fairbank Shakespeare Theatre Company debuted a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream that was performed mainly in English, but also included dialogue in three native Alaskan languages, Gwich'in, Klingit, and Yupik. And this is a, a language map of Alaska. A lot of people think that everybody in Alaska speaks Alaskan. Uh, you can see it's quite a bit different. Um, <clears throat> Um, translating English into Alaskan native languages in classical works, including Shakespeare plays, is not new for Alaskan theater troops. The Fairbank Shakespeare Theater, for example, performed a Gwich'in version of King Lear in 2013. The Perseverance Theater at Juneau did an Inupiaq version of Moby Dick in 2001, and an Aleut version of Othello in 2008. And as Scott has mentioned, there is the production of Macbeth uh, that started in 2004 and eventually culminated in the four sold out performances at the Smithsonian in 2007. Before discussing the 2015 performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream directly, I'd like to provide a bit of cultural context for the production. First, the decision to perform A Midsummer Night's Dream in three native Alaskan languages came from the University of Alaska Fairbanks Alaska Native Language Center, a center for research and documentation of the 20 
native languages in Alaska. And from Alan Hayden, who is the director of the Gwich'in Language Revitalization Program at Doyon Corporation. Part of the process, and the example of a Midsummer Night's Dream is not unique, involves translating and or adapting canonical Western literary works to indigenous languages and motifs, and then applying for grants to see those ideas to fruition as performances. The finished productions are then taken on the road to various native villages around Alaska. The hope is that children at the schools, where the curriculum is usually conducted in English, will develop an interest in learning one or more Alaskan indigenous languages. Um, <clears throat> in other words, this is closing the loop. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is part of the eighth grade curriculum in Alaska. Um, grants reinforce the teaching of Shakespeare at the same time teaching native languages and also providing uh, a lot of money to spend. <laughs> uh, the second part of the decision to include three Alaskan native languages is a bit more complicated and political. In 2014, then Governor Sean Parnell signed into law a bill making the 20 Alaskan native languages, as well as English, the official languages of Alaska. Before 2014, the, the law read simply as follows. English is the official language of Alaska. After the change, the law now reads as follows, and I've posted it here. Section one, official languages. English, Inupiaq, Siberian Yupik, Central Alaskan Yupik, Alutik, Unangax, Dainaina, and you can read the rest of them here. And to save time, I'll skip over them. However, in section two, notice it says, the designation of languages other than English as official languages of the state under A of this section does not require or place a duty or responsibility on the state or municipal government to print a document or record or conduct a meeting, assembly, or other government activity in any other language other than English. In other words, what the legislature giveth in A, they taketh away in B. According to Alan Hayton, <clears throat> the Gwich'in actor who played Theseus in Oberon and translated much of this work, he and director Tom Robinald originally planned to include at least one speech from each of the 20 Alaska native languages. But it became apparent that this was neither practical nor feasible given the time constraints and the problems of finding native speakers who could do the translations. Complicating things even further was the fact that Eoc is, in effect, an extinct language. The last fluent Eoc speaker died in 2008, and Haida, Shimshan, Han, and Upper Tanana are among languages that now have fewer than 10 speakers each. <coughs> So what would the play look like and sound like if the actors were speaking an official language that few or none of the audience understood or even knew existed? The concept of what it means to be an official language then is one that I'll return to shortly um, after, the, after the film clip. For my presentation today, I'll be showing about a six minute, uh, seven minute video from the production. If you're following <coughs> uh, along in the book, this is when the mechanicals are, are uh, rehearsing in the forest. Um, in this part, uh, this is where Bottom is transformed, or as he says, translated into a moose, uh, which is an important point that I'll return to later. Before we start, I'd like to point out four things you might want to pay attention to in the video. I'll discuss these things in a bit more formal, critical way uh, after showing the video. The first is the casting. Like most productions, there were problems with the actors. <coughs> Three of them, Hermia, Helena, and Lysander, who were all very young, 16, 17-year-old, fluent Gwich'in speakers, quit two weeks before the first performance and were replaced with actors who were more experienced but less fluent in Gwich'in. Therefore, the default is English, right, according to the state law. <laughs> uh, the fellow playing Oberon is Gwich'in. Bottom and Titania are Klingit. Puck is a Meskwakihaki from Iowa. Two, the costumes. Oberon, Bottom, and most of the other native actors are wearing traditional Gwich'in regalia. Titania is wearing a traditional Klingit clan costume, and Puck, the zany madcap Meskwakaki from, uh, from Iowa, is wearing a fantastic made-up costume designed to make her look like a doll sheep. The four lovers and other minor characters are wearing traditional Western outfits, 
that would be at home on the set of Oklahoma. Uh, <coughs> the setting is supposedly the Alaskan wilderness, a term that rankles most native Alaskans. Uh, four, finally, the language. Please note when the language shifts occur and how the notation of translation from one language to another is handled. Titania's speeches of power and command, for example, are in Klingit, while Oberon's are in Gwich'in. Scholars have often noted that translation in Shakespeare's day was closest to imitation, but my research and Shakespeare's 15 uses of the word translate indicate it has a much, more, much stronger, more transformative connotation. In other words, it seems to regularly indicate a change from one thing into another, like alchemy, or including elements of magic, the occult, or the uncanny. For example, earlier in Midsummer Night's Dream, Helena speaking to Hermia says, were the world mine to be just being baited, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. And then later in the play, Puck says to Oberon, I led them on in this distracted way and left Pyramus translated there. For Puck, the translation is from Pyramus to an ass. For Peter Quince, it's bottom to Pyramus to an ass. In both cases, the word translate indicates one character transformation into another and it has little to do with imitation. Also, this is not a professional production. Uh, it doesn't have a, they didn't have a lot of money behind this. It was shot using a stationary tripod mounted video camera. There's a lot of background noise and sounds coming from the audience. Please note when people laugh and when they don't, uh, because I'll be discussing the importance of this later. Um, there might be a brief break in the middle of this because I had to, uh, Josh is splicing two pieces together. But I think we can go ahead and play the clip now, if you wouldn't mind. to disfigure 
or to present the person of moonshine. <laughs> then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyrrhus and Disby says the story did talk through the chink of a wall. Uh, you can never bring in a wall. <laughs> What's a you bought? Some man or other must present wall. Let him have some plaster, or some loam, or some rough cast about him to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus. And through that cranny shall Pyramus and his be whispered. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down, everyone, the son, and rehearse your part. Pyramus, you begin. You have spoken your speech. Enter into that part. And so everyone, according to your cue. Hempen home buns have we swaggering here. <laughs> so near the cradle of the fairy queen. What? A play toward? I'll be an auditor. In act or two, perhaps. Give us the cause. Speak, Paris. Stand forth. <clears throat> this be the <laughs> flowers of odious savors <clears throat> sweet. Odors. Odors! Savor, <laughs> sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest is dear. But hark, a voice! Stay thou but here a while. <laughs> by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger, Pyramus, the air play here. <laughs> must I speak now? I bear a question, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Most radiant pyramids, most lily white of you. You! Of color like the red rose on triumphant briar. Most risky juvenile and eke most lovely Jew. Jew! As true as truest horse that yet would never. Tom Oliver! I'll meet the pyramids and it is too! Nineness, too. But you must not speak that yet. That answer to pyramids. You speak all your parts at once, cues and all. Pyramids enter your cue is past. It is never tired. Oh, as true as truest horse that yet would never tire. Queen Zishinichia, Chief Disby, Thumb Shriek, Nuts and Kithia. Sorry, we just got a note that we're over time, so I'll have to stop. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not a Shakespearean scholar. I'm a writer. Um, so um, I'm a writer who chose to adapt Shakespeare and encountered a few challenges. So I know we're running out of time, so I'll power through this. Um, so the main challenge is, how do you remain faithful to both literature and history without sacrificing authenticity? And uh, Kino and Teresa, the play I wrote, is an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, set in the 7th, 17th century uh, in New Mexico after the Pueblo Revolt during the Spanish Reconquest. Um, I, had been, I had written a play about the Pueblo Revolt before, 
and um, I was offered a commission to write another play, and I decided to write a sequel about when uh, the Spaniards came to reclaim New Mexico, and I thought, how did both sides, the Pueblo Indians and the Spaniards, how did they eventually learn how to coexist? Because New Mexico is a very, you know, diverse state, still is, rich with Spanish and American Indian uh, culture and history. And I, I hypothesized that there must have been something like a, a tragedy, like Romeo and Juliet, that eventually made both sides come together and realize they would have to coexist. So a little background. Uh, the Pueblo Revolt happened in 1680. Uh, it happened as a result of over nearly a century of oppression and torment um, to the Pueblo Indians by the Spaniards. Um, that prompted them to organize and successfully attack the Spanish colonizers, ousting them from New Mexico. Uh, the victory was so de de uh, decisive that the Spaniards weren't able to come back for a dozen years. And uh, by that time, unfortunately for the Pueblo Indians, the alliances had disintegrated due to infighting. So the Spaniards were able to pretty much waltz right back in. Um, when the Spaniards reclaimed New Mexico in 1692, memories of the Pueblo Revolt stirred up a lot of bad feelings between uh, the Pueblo Indians and the Spanish colonists. Um, and uh, this was uh, the catalyst for the idea that 17th century New Mexico could be a setting for Romeo and Juliet where the contentious Pueblo Indians and the Spanish colonists could take the place of the feuding Montagues and Capulets. And um, when I was doing a lot of research about the Spanish re, um, reconquest, I uh, found an opportunity to use actual historical figures and use them to stand in for their Shakespearean counterparts. For instance, uh, the governor of New Mexico during the reconquest was Don Diego de Vargas. And I felt that he could really easily fulfill the function of Prince Escalus, um, breaking up brawls between the Spaniards and the, and the uh, Pueblo Indians and imposing harsh penalties uh, for, dis for disturbing the peace. And um, for, during further research, I, I discovered that um, uh, Lorenzo Madrid, who was a, a prominent military official during the time, um, could fulfill the function of uh, Lord Capulet. Uh, and Felipe Chisto, who is governor of Pecos Pueblo, which is a tribe that's now extinct, but in um, 1692 was within proximity of Santa Fe, that um, he could fulfill the function of Montague. And um, so what would happen if these two warring factions had children that fell in love? And um, given that couplings between Spaniards and Indians during uh, this era was a historical fact. A Romeo and Juliet in 1692 Santa Fe, um, that should read, is not implausible. So um, I imagine that Lorenzo Madrid could have a daughter named Teresa, while Felipe Chisto, uh, the Pueblo governor, would have a son, Kino. And they could fulfill the roles of the star-crossed lovers in my adaptation. And uh, I assigned the rest of Shakespeare's characters roles as Spaniards and Pueblo Indians, and the scenes that took place in Venice now played out in Santa Fe. And this is just a, um, a listing of all the um, Shakespearean uh, characters in Romeo and Juliet and the Pueblo or Spanish counterparts that I gave them. I was able to f find roles Pueblo and, and Spanish roles for each of um, Shakespeare's major characters in Romeo and Juliet. And um, in the end, of course, tragedy is inevitable in literature and history, as the patriarchs from both families must learn to live with and learn from the fact that their hatred cost them the lives of their beloved children. So the play was first produced in 2005 by Native Voices at the Autry and received a rave review in the Los Angeles Times, which for me validated that a Native American adaptation of Shakespeare could be faithful to literature and history. And so um, uh, it was a happy ending for me. So um, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry we've gone over time, but we do have 10 minute, about 10 minutes um, for questions, and I will moderate that um, if you'd like to begin. So, questions? Um, excuse me. Um, thank you for this panel. I mean, I'm coming into my dis er, dissertation phase in a bit. Um, so I'm very grateful that you guys are here in this particular conference doing the things that I want to learn mm -hmm. in terms of Shakespeare. I guess my question goes along the lines of how does the, the current social movements like I Don't Know More or We're Still Here or We Are Mauna Kea um, infiltrate but also kind of help you be aware of how important this work is, how this needs to be something that's circulated and talked about amongst these big Shakespearean conferences, and um, is that something you, you've been aware of in the work that you're doing? Thank you. Thank you. So if you couldn't all hear the question, um, Rubain asked, how do current social political movements like Idle No More um, among Native people, how does this influence our thinking of what this work is, what its value is. I, I know for myself, I would say, those movements um, among young people have given them voice and let them find their voice and make them more ready to not think of, say, Shakespeare as something that is up there on a cloud and they have no participation with. When they see these adaptations or interpretations by other indigenous people, realize that this is something they can do too, right? The, it is a sense of saying it's not the other, that we have indigenized aspect of it and it's, it's part of our lives too. And if you wanna use it to express something about yourself or your culture, I think they feel a lot more empowered than I did. I was more intimidated by it when I was young as my approach to it. And I don't, I don't see that among my students. I can't speak for your other students. The others. Well, I think the, I mean, obviously the themes in Shakespeare are so universal that um, uh, you know it provides the opportunity to you know relate them to to modern um, you know issues. Uh, Terry was just commenting about how um, which work was it would be ideal for the Keystone Pipeline. Coriolanus. <laughs> We, uh, in Alaska, it's a little bit different, uh, a lot different. Um, and part of it is because, for instance, at the University of Alaska, where I teach, our uh, Native American student population usually ranges between 20 to 25 percent of our undergraduates. Uh, many of our um, students come from the lower 48, from, particularly from the Plains and uh, West Coast uh, Native tribes. Um, the uh, Alaskan students who come, many of them grow up in villages uh, without electricity or running water. And uh, when they come to the university, it's the first time they've uh, done things like riding elevators and so on, uh, mm -hmm. especially the people who are first out of their village. Um, but it's a, it's a really kind of an interesting climate. One of the things I was going to talk about after the clip was how uh, one of the wonderful things about this particular performance was how there was this wonderful interaction among the different native groups where it wasn't just a dichotomy between native culture and white culture or colonialist culture, that there was all this kind of goofing around uh, among the Klingets and the Gwichans and so on, and it was, uh, it was done, I, there are very few, I know Randy Reinholz has done Measure for Measure, but there are very few comedies that have been done uh, as indigenous plays. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not, um, you know, as far as the social movements and so on, we, we don't really experience those firsthand. Um, more Black Lives Matter and things like that, so. Other questions, please.
First of all, I want to thank you all for your um, wonderful talks. Uh, and something I noticed that I think was uh, common throughout them uh, that James, you talked about particularly, uh, was the speculation of uh, what has happened, what, what happened in the past. Um, and as you do research and literature and the history and whatnot, there's, there's those things that I think we can, uh, we can say, like factually this happened, and then there's things that we are not sure, but we are very interested in. And that was something I noticed in the other papers as well, is the speculation and even this hope of what did happen. And I'm wondering, and particularly in uh, the area of research and work that you're doing, how does that hope or speculation for what could have happened in the past, but is either not known because of lack of records or because uh, you haven't found those records yet, how does that inform uh, how you imagine um, indigenous Shakespeare happening in the future? How does that hope um, come into the future? Um, I, I'd like to speak to that just for uh, a second. The, um, how is it going to be in the future? Uh, well, uh, the production you were watching of the film clip was done during the Obama administration. Things have changed. Uh, and so just the money available, things, uh, there's, a, there's a whole different morale mentality and so on. But the thing that um, you were mentioning about the, the connection between the past and the present, it was interesting when, when that Alaskan language law passed because the people who celebrated were the old people. Um, and part of it was um, they weren't allowed to speak their native languages in school. And if they did, they were beaten. Um, so now what's happened is because they are official languages, they can, they can do, they have more of a legal identity and they can do things like file to have the ballots in, in native languages and in villages and so on. So that, that is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh one thing about, uh, I guess, the hope for the future is, is um, you know, uh, having um, Native tribes in general opening up more about their history. I mean, when I wrote this, um, Kino Teresa back in, in 2004 was the first draft, uh, we wanted to incorporate a lot of, um, of the Native language. We, we had a lot of Spanish language, and, but we wanted to include a lot of Native language as well. Um, uh, the Pecos uh, tribe, even though it's now extinct, their closest language relative is the Jemez Pueblo um, Indians. And we contacted them a year prior to the production to see if we could get their permission to use their language. And we never heard back from them until two days before opening night when they heard, yeah, we, they, they heard that we're, uh, we're using their language and they threatened to shut us down unless uh, we took all the language out. And that, that just shows that, I mean, I understood because um, the Pueblo people in particular have been very protective about their religion, their language, and uh, for, you know, for good reason. Um, and um, I think now going forward, um, especially now that uh, as far as the Pueblos go, maybe they're a little more secure financially and um, you know, hopefully the you know, casino <laughs> industry won't be disrupted, um, they're opening up a little more. So ho hopefully that'll translate into future um, adaptations where history and literature collide again. Lou, would you want to? No. Other questions? I might add to that that the, the linguistic aspect is, is key to a lot of our communities where we do have speakers, right? Um, you have some languages that are on the edge of extinction today. Happily, Mohawk, Ginyangiha is not one of them. And I can say that our, our student, my students today speak much more Mohawk than my generation or the generation ahead of us. And people are shocked, especially elders are shocked, how vibrant the language is among young people. One of the smartest things ever done on our reservation, Akwesasne, was that the elder hostel, where it's like an old folks home, but they have a lot more community care there, was placed next to the Mohawk children's school, the elementary school, where Mohawk is the first language that they're learning in. And every child had to adopt an elder as a grandparent and visit them once a week and speak with them in Mohawk. And that, I think, you know, the fact that my grandmother lived to 99, I, I credit to those little kids because she was so, it was like a second life to her. A language she thought that would be extinct in her lifetime 
was now something she could talk to a four or five year old. And they were writing her little cards and things like this. And so when I talk to students, you know, about would you ever put, translate a, a scene from Shakespeare into Mohawk, that seemed, that's something they could totally do, right? It's, it, that's an empowering thing. But one of the, colonialism leaves a lot of damage behind and um, it, it's a kind of pathology around language sometimes that you'll find communities want to be secretive about language and I'm like, that's the one thing we want to share, right? Because if you want to keep it a secret because you're used to so many things being taken from you, that you're going to hold your languages, that's the thing we want to share. Otherwise, it's going to become the biggest secret in history because there will be no speakers. And so, I, you know, we've had this debate with, within the Haudenosaunee community. The, the Onondaga don't want their language taught at Syracuse. Mohawk, we're happy to have it taught there. And we'd, we'd like the Chinese to speak Mohawk if they would put their mind to it. Um, we want everyone to speak Mohawk. But it's, and that's within our own community that there's this division among the Onondaga who are also Haudenosaunee people, but they have this, we don't want other people learning it. We want everyone to learn it. And it's just a difference, but I blame it on a kind of malaise that comes from colonialism where you're just so used to your religion being appropriated, your traditions with, that you think, well, we're gonna keep the language. So I, I think that this, all of these interactions on the linguistic level are the thing that give me the most hope about, about our future. Please. Uh, I just had a, a practice question. Um, for those of us who teach like a Shakespeare survey, what's the best place to start with teaching those kinds of materials that you all presented? What kind of additions or what advice do you have for those who might want to do material like this? I, I would say that to me, I would start with the plays in English like, like James um, because that will- Available on Amazon. <laughs> there you go. Um, delivered by a drone to you. Um, so. Please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.